As far as we know, Jesus taught his disciples one specific prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And within the Lord's Prayer, the words, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But when will the kingdom come? Next on The Prophetic Connection. It's late afternoon by the Sea of Galilee. The sun has already set behind the western hills, and we're losing the light with the setting of the sun. But around these shores, Jesus' ministry began. Along these shores, he called his first disciples, and they became eyewitnesses to incredible miracles such as the world had never seen. The miracle feeding of multitudes of people, thousands of people, in fact, and on this sea, in the midst of a terrible storm, Jesus walked in the darkest hour of the night and beckoned Peter to come out of the boat and walk toward him. It all happened around here. On the hills, he taught the Sermon on the Mount, and within the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. And within the Lord's Prayer, the words, saying to them, inviting them, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In other words, pray for God's kingdom to come, God's order to be established in the world. Remember that in that day, in Jesus' day, this land was occupied by Rome. There were Roman soldiers everywhere. And so the Jewish people were in bondage. They were not masters in their own land, in their own houses, because the Romans occupied the land and they ruled with an iron fist. And so when Jesus says to the disciples, pray the kingdom come, and they saw his power demonstrated over and over again, they had to wonder, in fact, their questions were a reflection of their wonder. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They asked him not once, but several times. His answer wasn't what they expected. The disciples of Jesus were eyewitnesses to many miracles. They saw him following his resurrection and wondered if he would now use the same power that raised him from the dead to restore the kingdom to Israel. After all, he had told them to pray for the kingdom to come. But what is the kingdom of heaven, and where does this concept come from? So the whole idea of this like kingdom of heaven concept on earth is an idea that originates in Judaism, and it's part of a whole historical process whereby we have this beginning the narrative of Adam and Eve where the world was in a perfect state of close, rela close and direct relationship with God, but that relationship unravels. I call it like the ultimate divorce story. And humanity separates from God. And since the purpose of creation is relationship with God, the purpose of creation is lost. And really, from the Jewish perspective, the narrative of, of human history is humanity trying to return to that close relationship with God. Paradise was lost in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve's willful disobedience severed the special relationship they had enjoyed with God. Sin had replaced innocence, and man had no way back to God, or so it seemed. God had another plan. In time, he would use one nation to build a new bridge to humanity. The question was, when and how God would allow the kingdom to come to earth? To understand, you have to go all the way back to um, Exodus after uh, the deliverance from Egypt and the people come out after 400 years of slavery, uh, they're, a, they're a dysfunctional, disorganized mass of former slaves in the desert and God met them there. In Exodus chapter 19, verses five and six, he says to them, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And what that means is the, even, before the, the, even before Sinai, God says, the, the basis of my agreement with you, my covenant, will be I become king, and therefore you become my kingdom. Moses led the Hebrew people out of slavery. His strong leadership shaped them as a nation. In time, God gave them kings to rule over them, 
But the people of Israel were not satisfied with the rule of mortal men. They longed for the promised Messiah, but there would be many centuries of struggle for Israel before that glorious day could dawn. And if you look at scripture, you see there's a commonality of theme of greats, I would say, of, 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 of difficult situation happening to the Jewish people in the world, even the, the, the wars of Gog and Magog and Zechariah and Ezekiel, of the world coming against Israel, but Israel not falling, of being a final showdown of good and evil. And eventually, you know, good wins a la the Messiah triumphs, Israel survives, the enemies of God are destroyed and the whole world gets back to an ideal state. But how would the Messiah bring about this ideal state? What is the Messiah's kingdom role where Israel is concerned? And the Messiah, from a Jewish perspective, he's not the end of the story. He, like I say in, in chemistry, is a catalyst. His job is to prepare not just the Jewish people, but the whole world to enter that final sort of kingdom of heaven, to get back to the garden, so to speak. But what did Jesus actually teach about the kingdom of heaven coming to earth? Just about everything that Jesus taught had to do with the kingdom. The kingdom of God is something that he wants to establish on earth as it is in heaven. And you know, 40 days he taught his disciples after he rose from the dead, and it says that he taught them about the kingdom of God. So he began his ministry with the kingdom of God. He ended his earthly ministry with the kingdom of God. It was central to everything. And so praying for the kingdom to come is really praying according to his will, according to his central purpose for why he came. He didn't come just to save souls. He came to change souls. He came to change our lives and to live out kingdom principles on the earth. The question remains, how close are we to the coming kingdom Jesus had promised. The signs that uh, Jesus said would single, signal the, the nearness of the kingdom had to do uh, with his words uh, from the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said clearly that there would be um, times of wars and rumors of wars that would lead up to the coming of God's kingdom. And he, he made it clear that he wanted his disciples not to be frightened by these things he said, these things must take place. A nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be wars, famines, earthquakes in various places, but they are just the beginning of birth pangs. The end is not yet. He said, when you see these things happening, it's, it's time to prepare. But his words to his disciples then are just as relevant to us today, and that is, see that you are not frightened by these things. They must come to pass. Over my shoulders, the holy city, Jerusalem, the epicenter of God's prophetic plans. The only place on earth he said he would place his name. Over my left shoulder, the Temple Mount, where the Temple of Solomon and the later Temple of Herod once stood. And over my right shoulder, the Mount of Olives. These are the places so familiar to Jesus and, of course, in the ministry of Jesus. Many times he crossed the Kidron Valley below, going either to the Temple Mount or going to the Mount of Olives. It was here that Jesus walked, talked, preached, was crucified, rose from the dead, and from here, from the Mount of Olives, ascended into heaven. Jesus loved Jerusalem, but he also wept over it. Listen to Luke's account of Palm Sunday when he rode in triumph, albeit on a donkey, but he came here as the king toward the holy city. And here's the description in Luke 19 and verse 37. Then as he, Jesus, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him, to Jesus, from the crowd. And the Pharisees were one of two primary religious sects, the other being the Sadducees. And they followed Jesus everywhere he went. And they criticized him and they peppered him with questions, um, almost trying to catch him 
contradicting the law of Moses, but he was wise to their ways. He was wary of them. And so they said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And of course, he was as well the God of all creation, so he could make the stones cry out for joy as the king approached the holy city. But then strangely, in the midst of this incredible celebration, you can imagine parents with their children, lifting their children up on their shoulders to get a better glimpse of the one sitting on the little donkey. In verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. I'm actually standing higher than the Temple Mount and over my right shoulder, the Mount of Olives. And Jesus came from that direction. So when he would have come over the Mount of Olives, the whole city would have been in front of him. And he loved it so much, he wept over it. But he wasn't weeping just for the city. He was weeping for the people in the city, of the city, because he saw the prophetic future. And it wasn't, it was bleak. And so we read these words. As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, this was their day. He was their Messiah, but he knew that they were going to reject him, and he knew what was to come a few days later. If you had known, even you, especially on this your day, the things that make for your peace. Jerusalem means peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, meaning a siege wall. And that was, of course, how the Romans attacked cities. They built a siege wall, and then they starved the people into submission, or at least made them weak so they could attack when they couldn't defend themselves. Jesus saw this that day on Palm Sunday. And he says, they will close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This was the day of their visitation. He was the Messiah coming in triumph to Jerusalem, but they could not see that. They didn't understand that. And then he says to them, they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Where you see the golden dome, there once stood the Temple of Solomon. 3,000 years ago, the, the actual Temple of Solomon, but it was destroyed by the armies of Babylon. And then it was later rebuilt. And in the time of King Herod, it was even greater than the one of Solomon. In fact, the 20-acre site of the Temple Mount, that the colonnades of the temple covered the whole thing. It was a grand. It was the center of Jewish life and worship. And Jesus makes this astonishing statement, they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Now, we read the same account, more or less, in the Gospel of Matthew, and in tw Matthew 23, and beginning in verse 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And the house, of course, the temple, desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And of course, Jerusalem is still waiting for the fulfillment of those words of that particular prophecy. And then as Matthew 24 opens, we read, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Why? Because it was so grand. They just wanted to say, Jesus, isn't this a remarkable um, structure? And what he said to them in response shocked them. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Remember, this is a 20-acre site with the temple at the center of it, but the temple courts and the colonnades. It was a gorgeous thing to see. And he says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Not one stone. I can take you to the far side of the Temple Mount, and I can actually show you the stones that were cast down 
2,000 years ago exactly what he said. In the year AD 70, when the Roman armies lay siege to Jerusalem, conquered it, killed hundreds of thousands of Jews in its streets, and systematically took down the temple and the colonnades and left nothing. In fact, they flattened the whole area as a symbol of the way they conquered the Jews and Jerusalem. Now, having said that, Jesus placed in the disciples' minds incredible questions. And we read, as we read on, it says in verse 3 of Matthew 24, Now, as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, over my right shoulder again, the disciples came to him privately saying, you can see that this troubled them all day long because they needed to ask these questions of him, not in front of the crowds, but privately. And they came and they said, they asked him three questions really. They said to him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then he went on to give them what we call the signs of the times the signs that would precede his second coming, the answers to the questions they had just asked him. And here is what he said to them. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, meaning the anointed one, the Messiah, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Jerusalem seems peaceful today, it's actually the Sabbath day, and so the Jewish people are observing a day of, of rest. They're with their families, or they go to the synagogue to worship. But not far from here in Syria, a civil war is raging, and people are being killed in that civil war. Wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And then this intriguing statement. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now Jesus draws a parallel to a woman carrying a child. And in fact, the translation in the original Greek language, it suggests birth pangs or birth pains. And there are two things that we should notice about this statement. One is that when a woman is about to give birth, she feels a pain and then another pain and the pains become more frequent. But at the same time, they become more intense. And Jesus seems to be saying that as the days accelerate toward his second coming, then these things will increase in intensity and they'll be more frequent than ever before. The U.S. Geological Survey that monitors earthquake occurrences around the world has charts that show that during the 20th century and into the 21st century, the graph goes like this. More and more earthquakes, not all of them are major, but many are, but many more smaller earthquakes, many more earthquakes, it seems, than ever before. Now, when we move into Luke's Gospel, which is the, um, the parallel account of the answers that Jesus gave his disciples, he has other things to say in Luke chapter 21. And he says something that Matthew doesn't mention. He says um, that on the earth there will be distress of nations. We seem to have problems today that no one is able to solve. And we search for peace, but the nations seem to find ways to um, take over, cross over borders, and invade other countries and there are economic distresses everywhere and so we live in an age of great distress and perplexity you would think that by now after the wars of the 20th century that the united nations and the nations coming together could find a way to establish a peace that would last but peace seems to be as elusive as ever and so on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And of course, we're seeing intense storms. We're seeing, we have seen tsunamis with tremendous loss of life and devastation of property. And Luke says this too, uh, this is as well a sign of the times. 
And then he says in verse 26 of Luke 21, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. But then the hope, having said these things about these catastrophes to come, the hope that he expresses, he says, verse 28, Luke 21, now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. And then he seems to give yet another clue, another sign of the times. And he says in verse 29, then he spoke to them a parable. Jesus loved to tell stories, but within the stories, significant meaning. So here's another one of his stories. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Now, the fig tree is one of the symbols of Israel, as is the olive tree. But he doesn't just mention the fig tree, he says, and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. And we know that when we see buds in the trees, that's telling us that the winter has passed, the spring has come, and summer is just around the corner. So he says something similar to that. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, the generation that sees these signs, will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. In this brand new season of the Prophetic Connection, we want to examine many of the prophecies in the Bible that point to Jesus' return. Specifically, the things that Jesus himself said when he was asked, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And of course, he gave that long discourse that's recorded in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. But I want to give you a glimpse into the future of the series with these words that come from the very last book of the Bible in the book of Revelation in chapter 16, in verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. These are a series of judgments that are, are to come according to John, who wrote the book of Revelation, who received the revelation from the risen Jesus of Nazareth. And the, its water, the water of the river Euphrates was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And this may be speaking of the armies of the Orient, China, and other places who are able to march west across the dry riverbed that formerly was the river Euphrates, which flows today in that region of Iraq and Iran. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. This is another a synonym for Satan the devil, out of the mouth of the beast, meaning the Antichrist, we will examine the character of this biblical um, mentioned figure. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, and that's someone, a religious figure presumably, who does the Antichrist bidding. And if you stop to think about it, this is an unholy trinity over and against the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we're told in verse 14 of Revelation 16, for they are the spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings, if you like, the rulers of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, God's battle. Then verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This is a warning, a plea to those who believe in Jesus Christ to stay alert and to walk in righteousness in fellowship with him because things are going to get worse before they ever get better. And then finally, this verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon.